Hello once again, and welcome to our next module here in the class. And as you can see, in this module, we're going to be looking specifically at the impact on health of the agricultural or green revolution and the nature of 21st century American food. And we've talked about this, at least in passing, in a number of different places so far in the class, talking about the lower quality products produced by industrial agriculture. Uh, the contamination of meat with different hormones and antibiotics uh, and these sorts of things. Uh, and then in the last module, we looked at the impact of corporations on American food uh, and how one of the criticisms of them is that they've led to poorer health, poorer food in America. We didn't really develop that point uh, very much in that module. So in this module, we're really going to focus on that idea. Uh, we've looked at the impact on workers, the impact on the land, the impact on the animals. Uh, here we want to focus on what's the impact on human health from this transformation of American agriculture that's taken place. Um, and obviously, one of the uh, most striking facts about modern American life uh, is uh, the issues surrounding our health. Uh, and of course, the number one issue that everybody focuses on uh, is the rise in obesity, uh, that America has uh, grown uh, more and more overweight uh, with a really remarkable or even terrifying uh, speed over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, this is something that's talked about uh, a lot, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, clear uh, discussion of what is really causing it, uh, and there certainly doesn't seem to be any sort of real meaningful action being taken uh, to address it. Uh, but this is really one of the more uh, important topics in America today. Um, if we think back to the very beginning of the class with uh, the understanding of the human person uh, from a Christian point, uh, a Christian viewpoint, uh, and if we look at the human person, the human person is not just the spirit of the soul. Right? The human person is this unique combination of body and soul together. So the body is really an essential part of who we are. It's an essential part of each of our identities. Uh, and so what we do with the body really matters. It really has uh, a real profound significance. Uh, and as we moved on to talk about natural law, uh, we talked about the, these basic goods that we pursue, right? These, these goods that we go after uh, and that we need in order to have this flourishing life, right? The ultimate goal is this, this human life well lived, becoming uh, what a human being is meant to be. And to do that, we need these different uh, basic goods. And one of those basic goods is bodily health, right? That you could have um, all the other good things in life that you might want, uh, but if you were in terrible health, nobody would say that you were a really flourishing as a person. Now, that's not to say that you can't have a good life uh, and struggle with health issues. Obviously, you can. We would all, I think, recognize that it would be better to have all of those other goods of family and career and leisure time and all those things and also be um, healthy, right? So bodily health is one of these basic goods that we all uh, want, uh, that we all need to really attain uh, our goals in life. Uh, and we've also talked about, uh, in discussing natural law, how we shouldn't sacrifice uh, a higher, more important good for a lower one, right? That we shouldn't uh, sacrifice, for example, uh, the goods of an education, of a career, of the family stability that can all bring uh, in exchange for drinking too much or in exchange for partying instead of studying and getting an education that it is, in fact, immoral to choose those lower goods of partying or drinking uh, if it's going to cost us these more important goods of education, of good for our family, uh, of a successful career. But the same thing, of course, can happen uh, with other goods, right? That if we pursue uh, goods of pleasure or goods of leisure and rest and relaxation over the more important good of bodily health, uh, that too would be immoral. That would be uh, a sin. So to choose uh, to enjoy the pleasure of eating to the point where or in a way which 
undermines our health is wrong. Uh, and traditionally, Christianity has counted gluttony as one of the, the deadly sins, uh, although it doesn't get a lot of mention today, perhaps because it would be kind of awkward uh, for the pastor to be giving that sermon or that homily and looking around at the congregation. But nonetheless, gluttony has traditionally been understood to be a sin because you're sacrificing this higher good of bodily health uh, for this lower good of pleasure. Uh, and yet, we can all agree on these things, that being healthy is good, that you need it to flourish, that it's wrong to sacrifice our health for the pleasure of uh, the second cheeseburger or uh, the pint of Ben and Jerry's. We can all agree to those things. And yet, what happens? Every year, uh, things continue. Every year, uh, obesity becomes a bigger and bigger problem uh, in America in more ways than one. Um, and it's, of course, having a devastating impact on American life. Right? This isn't simply an individual issue. As we all know, uh, there's a huge debate going on about health care, and especially health care costs. Uh, but we also all know that a huge part of those health care costs are obesity-related expenses, heart disease, and cancer, uh, and all kinds of things that follow from uh, an unhealthy diet, uh, unhealthy eating, uh, and the obesity that comes from it. So it's not just an impact on individuals, it's not just the impact on quality of life, there's a huge impact in terms of public health costs, uh, but there are also many other costs as well. There's costs in lost productivity. Uh, people who are sick and unhealthy uh, don't lead as productive of lives. Uh, and we end up focusing many of our resources that are currently being given to treating a lot of these ailments, we could be using that time and energy and money uh, to do other things, to do more productive things as opposed to treating the consequences uh, of American obesity. So this is really uh, a very important issue in American life today. Uh, but what is ultimately causing it? Right? And, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of arguments, a lot of discussions about this uh, the finger gets pointed at the American people, right? It's individual Americans who are consistently choosing to eat unhealthy food uh, instead of the healthy stuff. But we all know uh, that the vast majority of Americans, when faced with, should I eat my vegetables or should I eat a Twinkie, are going to eat the Twinkie. Uh, you know, they're going to eat uh, the cheeseburger over and against uh, the garden salad. And basically, the argument made by many, particularly by the food industry, is just this, that it's simply a question of American choice. We can try to educate people about what healthy options are, but that's all we can really do. It's up to American free choice, what, how they want to eat, and we just have to deal with the consequences. Uh, but there are a growing number of people, uh, a growing number of even scholars and scientists, um, who are arguing that that's not really the right picture. And in fact, what's happening in America is corporations uh, choosing profits over the good of people. Uh, that we have, uh, in fact, in America, set up a system uh, which encourages people to eat in unhealthy ways uh, because it is so profitable uh, for the current uh, agricultural system in America. Uh, so that is really the crux of the argument here. Is uh, poor American health, and in particular obesity, uh, is that due to just lots of individual choices made by Americans who are choosing poorly, or is it in fact a more complicated issue, something that would fall into the category of, say, social sin or a violation of social teaching or social justice, where corporations are in fact creating uh, this situation because it's profitable for them. Now, when I was thinking about uh, putting together this module and presenting it to you, I've seen a whole range of studies and articles, uh, videos and interviews that we could look at. And I'm sure you've seen many uh, things yourself about uh, health and food and all these things. And I was going to put them all together uh, and kind of give you a, a number of the facts about how uh, the corporations influence policy, how the policy shapes the food, and how we end up subsidizing corn, which turns into high fructose corn syrup, which turns into the big gulp and the Twinkie, what have you. Um, and that is uh, uh, 
story that's widely disseminated and out there. Uh, but as I was doing some of the research, I came across uh, this report by Peter Jennings, uh, and I realize now uh, that many of you perhaps didn't really see Peter Jennings when he was on the news, but he was uh, an anchor for ABC for many years um, uh, and uh, did a lot of you know the, the real hardcore investigative journalism. And he put together uh, a few years ago, I think in 2003, uh, this very nice uh, report on uh, the relationship between uh, corporate agriculture uh, and American health and obesity. Uh, so what I want you to do for the majority of this module is to uh, watch this report uh, that Jennings put together because he's going to spell out for you uh, uh, really how all this happens and how in fact it's not just a question of individual choice but is in fact a question of uh, corporations and government policy that have created uh, this landscape which has produced this uh, obesity epidemic in America. And he'll talk about at the beginning of the clip really how he didn't go into it expecting this to be the case. Uh, and again, uh, Jennings was a respected uh, newsman for many years. And he certainly wasn't some sort of kind of flaming radical who was out to uh, take down American corporations. And so the fact, I think, that he comes to this conclusion uh, does give it a certain weight uh, to his argument. So what I'd like you to do is to uh, take the time and watch for yourself uh, this report that he gives on uh, corporate influence on the American diet and American health. Uh, then after you watch it, uh, please then go just to the final page of the module and we will conclude with some uh, questions for you to then discuss on Blackboard uh, your own reactions uh, to this report. Now that you've watched uh, Jenny's report, uh, what I want to do is just uh, lead us into a discussion of it and a discussion of your reactions to it uh, on Blackboard. Uh, and in particular, from the perspective of our work in the class, I think one of the important things about this uh, topic and about this report uh, for our purposes is, again, to think about kind of social sin or social justice issues. Uh, and that this isn't really primarily an issue of individual sins, right? It's not simply uh, the vast majority of Americans happening to make the wrong choice over and over again. That, in fact, uh, what we've done is create a system uh, that is promoting these poor choices and leading us to these bad results. Um, and again, I think this is something that we've looked at uh, with other issues, whether it's, um, I don't know, whether it's, it's eating on the run or... Uh, choosing uh, motion over community or connection with the land. In any particular case, it's not necessarily wrong, right? There's nothing intrinsically immoral, it would seem, about eating a tweet, right? The problem is looking at the cumulative results of this system, of this type of agricultural system or food system. When we look at it as a whole, uh, that's where it becomes problematic. Right? It's not one person occasionally eating a Twinkie and otherwise exercising and eating a healthy diet. It's setting up a system where people are uh, put in a context where they are going to repeatedly choose the Twinkie over the healthier options. Um, this raises all kinds of questions, again, which Jennings uh, addresses in uh, the report. You know, what sort of actions should we take at many? Should we treat... Um, unhealthy food, like a controlled substance, like it's tobacco or like it's illicit drugs? Um, do we need to, to limit it? Do we need to ban it and make it illegal? Uh, and of course, since uh, this report was put together, this has happened, particularly in New York City, where trans fat has been outlawed and where uh, the mayor is, is seeking to ban uh, huge fountain drinks. Um, you know, or should we uh, restrict the advertising uh, like we do with tobacco or alcohol. Uh, perhaps less drastically, should we change our policies uh, in order to promote fruits and vegetables instead of high fructose corn syrup? Obviously, you can see from Jenny's report that he clearly thinks that would be uh, a reasonable step. Uh, but is that something that we should do, or is that uh, kind of forcing Americans uh, to follow kind of government policy instead of their own free will? Um, 
And these are all big questions. One of the other things, though, I think that we can focus on, again, in this class, is looking at this from the perspective of a Christian worldview. Uh, and say, well, yes, I think we should advocate for a change uh, in terms of government policy, but also then how do we as individuals react? Um, if this system is, in fact, producing all of these uh, bad results for people, and in particular for the poor and the marginalized uh, who seem to have the worst diets and the worst health, what should we do in response? Uh, and even if it might be, say, for example, healthy for us to occasionally get the big gulp or uh, the McDonald's uh, supersized meal, um, when we do that, are we in fact uh, contributing to a system that's doing lots of immoral things, that's choosing profits uh, and political power over the good of people. And if we do that, are we then uh, involved in a degree of material cooperation with that system that would be morally wrong for us? Um, are we supporting uh, this overall system with our uh, occasional choices of unhealthy food uh, in a way that we need to stop? Right? And one of the things I think uh, that came to my mind, at least when thinking about this, was a passage from 1 Corinthians, where Paul is writing, uh, in that case, he's not writing about Big Macs, of course. He's writing about food that was offered to idols. And there were uh, many places where uh, the pagans at the time would offer their food to idols as they butchered it uh, and prepared it. Uh, and Paul thought that we could still eat it as Christians, right? Because idols are just hunks of wood or stone. There's nothing really real about an idol, so it doesn't really matter. However, he recognized that there were some Christians who were who were new Christians or who still had some lingering beliefs in the old system. And for them, uh, this was a real issue. And so if they saw uh, older, mature Christians eating this food, it might lead them to backslide. It might lead them to uh, think, well, okay, maybe the idols are okay, and they would end up falling back into paganism. And so Paul wrote to the Christians in, in Corinth uh, and told them, you know, if that might happen, you should just stop eating the food. Even though it could be okay for you, if it's going to be problematic for uh, your weaker brother or sister, then you should give it up. Uh, so one question I think to consider would be, um, even if we might be basically healthy, uh, might be able to make reasonable choices about how to eat properly, uh, could we make the same argument here? that uh, from a scriptural basis or from a natural law or social justice basis, uh, is it immoral to support fast food, to support the highly processed foods, um, even if it might be okay individually because we're supporting the system that has these bad outcomes and is ultimately going to hurt uh, lots of other people. So, uh, you've uh, seen my little intro and conclusion now, you've watched Jenny's report, so what I'd like to, of course, do now is to see your own thoughts and reactions to it uh, and to these questions and issues on Blackboard.